My name is Jessica Rosewitz. I'm an assistant teaching professor at Worcester Polytechnic Institute, which is in the center of Massachusetts in Worcester. And today I'll be talking to Vishnu and Samjum about my PhD research, which was on developing a self-activated healing concrete using an enzyme that is found in all living life on Earth. Welcome, Dr. Rosewitz, and thank you so much for appearing on our podcast. You're welcome. One thing that I think everyone needs to understand about concrete is that no matter what you do, it will crack. It is designed to do that. And you may think like, oh no, I'm going to have cracks in my concrete. That's going to be terrible. Things are going to fall down. But concrete is designed to crack. It's typically, it's strong and it's strong to hold things in compression. So when you think about concrete structures, we have them as foundations for homes. And so the homes are pushing down on those foundations. And it's strong in compression, but not in tension. And so for a material like that, we consider it brittle. And then when it breaks, it's a catastrophic fracture. So we reinforce it with concrete, but cracking is still a primary concern of people who place concrete in the, in the world. So contractors and people who design concrete in the world, so engineers and structural engineers and civil engineers. And the cracking of concrete, we want to try to contain it, and we want to try to control it and prevent it from becoming too big. <clears throat> and so the reason why it's a concern is the durability and the longevity of our structures. If we can control cracking, then we can have long-lived and durable concrete structures that we won't have to replace later on down the road. So things that go into um, making sure that a concrete doesn't crack that much and that we have good durability are our initial mix design. And so how do you, um, from a contractor's perspective, from an engineer's perspective, how much water do you mix in with your Portland cement powder, which would make a binding agent? And then how much coarse and fine aggregate, so sand and gravel, would you mix in? And then how are you going to place it? There's many different methods out there. And how are you going to reinforce it? Um, and how are you going to cure it? <clears throat> so as concrete cures, it hardens from a, a thick, soupy paste into a hard rock-like structure. And so our methods of controlling the cracking in concrete can only go so far because in in-service conditions, concrete also cracks. And when I say in-service, I mean... Uh, foundation of a home is in service when it's holding up the home and the people that are in it or a retaining wall that you see on the side of a highway as you're driving by that's in service when it's holding the earth back from falling onto the road and crushing the cars so concrete cracks in service just by the very nature of its design um, and so we want to try to account for that cracking in the life cycle life cycle of a concrete structure so we in the united states and you think about <clears throat> trying to think about quantifying how much concrete's out there in the real world. There are more than 4 million miles of roads in the United States and about 47,000 miles of interstate highways in the U.S. About 60% of those are concrete paved and 20% of those roads are in poor condition. And so we have a large number of miles, thousands of miles of concrete roadways that are in really poor condition right now and need rehabilitation just because of the nature of the material that was used to build them in the first place. And so those are kind of the limitations that you get with using concrete. Now, this is not to say that concrete is bad. It's a wonderful building material. It's, it's, completely formable to whatever the architect, the engineer, the contractor wants it to be. And there's many innovative ways to reinforce concrete. And it's a really wonderful building material. Um, anyone can use it and anyone can mix it together. And that's why it's so good to use. But it does crack. But you have to try to control it. So <laughs> hopefully that answers your question. So um, why is concrete designed to crack? Oh, great question. Yeah. So I mentioned that concrete is strong in compression and weak in tension. And it's strong in compression because like a rock, it can withstand loads 
pushing down on it. But if you were to just try to pull concrete, which would be a type of tensile stress or a tension load, then the concrete would fracture and it would break apart. Um, so it's the nature of the um, chemical composition. There's a binding agent. The binding agent is a mix of ordinary Portland cement powder, OPC, and water. And when you mix those two together, then it turns into a very um, muddy type of slurry and you'll fill in aggregates and as the concrete cures there's binding between the wet slurry and the aggregates to form a rock but there's no strong there's not a large amount of tensile strength in concrete but there's a large amount of compressive strength in concrete so because you don't have a large amount of tensile strength if you have tensile stresses on a structure you will get cracking caused by those pulling apart or tension stresses and typical cracking on a structure is on the microscopic size of things um, it's not something that you would see when I say every concrete structure cracks I'm not saying that it's like a large crack that you would see and like worry about, but microscopic cracks that you won't see, that's typically what we, when I, that's what I mean when I say that every concrete structure cracks, but it's designed to do that. And that's why we reinforce concrete with steel rebar, for example, which are these um, thin diameter, anywhere from three eighths of an inch um, all the way up to sometimes an inch and a half or two inches, long steel rods that are providing the tensile strength in a concrete structure. So all the concrete that you see out there in the world, the majority of it is reinforced with steel rebar to provide the tension strength that is not inherent in the concrete itself. What causes traditional concrete to weather and deteriorate? Um, and additionally, what issues, um, or sorry, what are the issues that we face when attempting to repair damaged concrete? Yeah, so when concrete is out there in the world, typically it's something that has one surface of it or a multiple surface of it exposed to the weather. So um, a retaining wall is a fantastic example of an exposed concrete structure. You'll have one side exposed to the to the weather, to rain, to the air, and you'll have the other side buried behind the earth. Um, <clears throat> and so there's a lot of things that happen in the environment that this concrete is in that can affect its longevity. And for a roadway, for like a retaining wall next to a roadway, um, the de-icing salts that are used on the road, for example, what we have in New England and in colder climates, so not something you would experience in San Jose, but what I would experience here in Massachusetts, those de-icing salts are chloride based. And those chlorides can um, cause degradation of the surface of the concrete and they can work their way in to the level where the rebar is beneath the surface of the concrete. And that can cause the rebar, the steel rebar to rust and then rust is an expansive product of oxidation and it would cause the concrete to crack. And so in cold climates where you have de-icing salts, that's why you would see retaining walls next to roadways have a cracked surface on them. And that's why you might see exposed rusty steel rebar where you would expect that not to have to happen. There's also... Um, environmental degradation of concrete that can occur um, <clears throat> from within the material itself. There's something called an alkali aggregate reaction um, or an alkali silica reaction, <clears throat> depending on the specific specificity of what you've got going on, where the actual rocks that are used to fill in the concrete and to provide it some compressive strength, or what we call the coarse aggregates, those can have a long-term chemical reaction where they can have an expansive foam form um, when the products of the concrete curing and the rock 
stay together over time. There's a chemical reaction that happens and that expansive foam can crack the concrete as well from within. Um, <clears throat> so that's a case where um, you want to make sure that you have like really good control over the aggregates that you're using. Um, and for the case of preventing de-icing salts, you want to make sure that you have enough of what we call concrete cover. And so cover is the thickness of the concrete that you would see from the surface before you would get down to the level of where the rebar is. So the rebar should not be placed right at the surface of the concrete. It should be placed a certain distance in so that there's the protective layer of concrete that would prevent those chlorides from getting from where they are at the roadway into the level of the rebar. There's other things that can affect the longevity of a concrete structure and cause deterioration. <clears throat> if you have um, loads that are above design, for example, if you're talking about the uh, concrete beam for a bridge, if you have really unexpected high traffic loads or volumes or frequency, that can cause cracking. And cracking can then open a pathway for um, environmental hazards to permeate further into the concrete and get to the rebar and cause oxidation and the expansive rust product and cause failure of the concrete structure. Um, <clears throat> kind of regardless of how that happens, of how cracking or deterioration occurs, whether it's from loads, whether it's from um, de-icing salts, um, or whether it's from excessive carbonation from high levels of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, um, the rebar becomes more susceptible co to corrosion once it's exposed to air and water in our atmosphere. Um, and so <clears throat> we want to make sure that through proper controls in design and construction, we prevent that from happening. But it still does happen. Um, the repair of that now, so say we want to talk about transitioning from talking about what causes the damage and weather and deterioration to concrete. And we want to talk about now, how do you repair? Um, you have to consider repairing the cracks in the concrete and repairing the reinforcing steel or rebar, reinforcing bar, and that's in the concrete itself. And so this repair process can take several forms. In general, what you'll see, and I use the concept of a retaining wall. I use the example of a retaining wall because it's something that a lot of people see if they're driving down a highway. Um, <clears throat> and retaining walls generally because they're subjected to so many traffic loads and so much um, car exhaust, they tend to have a lot of weathering effect on them. Um, but the first step is to take a hammer or and a chisel and chip away the concrete that is not sound. And when I say sound, I mean concrete that is really well adhered and is part of the mass of concrete, so it hasn't broken apart. It hasn't had the corrosive product rust, the expansive product, push it away from the substrate. The substrate is sort of the mass of the concrete. We want that entire mass to be sound. We want it to be solid, to not have any holes, to not have any cracks in it. So you have to chip away the bad concrete. Typically, you do this to expose the rebar that has been that has corroded and caused the issue. And then if the rebar is corroded to the point where there's not a lot of it left, then because it's been rusting for so long that it's rusted away into rust, <laughs> basically, um, then you have to sort of weld in a new piece of rebar and then patch that with some concrete. Um, now that would be the case if you had to repair because the rebar rusted too much. Sometimes, you just have cracks in concrete structures where you don't, where you still have sound concrete. So if you were to take a hammer to it and kind of tap along, you would hear nice solid suds. If concrete is not sound, when you tap along it, you hear a, a pop. As you hit the surface, it sort of bounces back against you and you get a, a, a popping noise, let's say, between the unsound concrete and the sound concrete substrate. So if you had the case where you had sound concrete everywhere, but you just had these cracks, then another method to repair concrete would be to um, inject something into the crack, for example, epoxy, 
or to patch the crack with fresh mortar to seal it. Because if we remember the reason why we... Concrete will crack, yes, right? We can protect the rebar and the reinforcing steel from rust. That's what we want. So we want to prevent water and air penetrating through the cracks to get to the level of the rebar below the cover. So we need to fix the cracks. Fixing the cracks can either be epoxy injection, typically, or patching with mortar. Mortar is just a mix of um, sand and the binder, which is the ordinary pointless cement powder and water. Um, <clears throat> another other methods you could there's like a long list of a laundry list I would say of ways to patch concrete, but those are kind of like your basic ways to repair concrete. Right, and so now getting more into detail with your research specifically. Uh, your team created a self-healing cementitious material using enzymatic self-healing to repair itself. So could you explain how exactly does your self-healing cementitious material work and what scientific procedures occur in the background of the process? Yeah. So I like to call it self-activated healing. Um, there's a like a minor distinction, um, and I guess I'll get into it now. So when I think about something that's self-healing, that means to me that there's no external influences that would need to be applied for something to heal itself. And so we are self-healing to an extent, right? We don't need to necessarily apply things to have a cut or a crack in our skin heal. Um, my work, my PhD work, um, and that of my colleagues, I consider self-activated healing in that there is kind of an external agent that does need to be applied to to get a continuous level of healing. And so I'll kind of get into that. <clears throat> the overarching objective of the research was to develop a self-healing concrete, but we sort of didn't get that far. We got to the point of self-activated healing. Um, and the idea was that we introduced a naturally occurring, inexpensive, and readily available enzyme. It goes by the name of carbonic anhydrase. And we use that enzyme to expedite the plugging of holes and repairing of flaws and cracks in damaged concrete substrates. And so um, the research that I worked on, it introduced methods to repair concrete using these enzyme or this enzyme, carbonic anhydrase. Um, it catalyzes, the enzyme itself, catalyzes calcium carbonate crystal precipitation. And so enzymes are sort of like helpers in a way. If you think about a typical chemical reaction that you would do in a beaker in a science class, or you know, if you would mix two solutions together, um, those solutions would kind of disassociate and then the product would be the sum of the two parts. Now, Enzymes work a little bit differently. They're little helpers. They facilitate the formation of a new product. And once that new product is made, then they disassociate and go off and form a new product. So the carbonic anhydrase enzyme in CA enzyme in um, my research, it catalyzed calcium carbonate crystal precipitation. And so calcium carbonate also is known as calcite. It's the chemical uh, equation CaCO3. So cal one atom of calcium to one atom of carbon to three atoms of oxygen, CaCO3. Um, <clears throat> and so calcite or calcium carbonate is our repair material that we use to um, repair cracks and plug holes and repair flaws in concrete surfaces. And so the um, enzyme within a solution and within the, the mix of the concrete, it will help to create these calcite crystals. And then the calcite crystals end up bonding. And we found through the research that they bonded to the concrete substrate or to the concrete itself. And then they sort of built in this little crystalline repair to plug holes and repair flaws. And we found through our research, through testing, that the strength of our samples that we repaired 
was brought back to its initial strength when we plugged and when we repaired the damage to the concrete. Now, the damage that we were repairing was in laboratory scale samples. And so this was um, little cubes. And these little cubes were, I created flaws in them. So I created cracks. And then in the lab, we repaired those cracks using the method that we have. And um, now we tested those repaired cubes and we found that the strength of those repaired cubes was equal to, and in some cases greater than, and in some cases less than, as is the nature of testing, um, that the repaired cube strength was about equal to, and sometimes greater than, the what we call an intact or control sample, which would be something that was untouched, that was sound concrete um, or virgin concrete, that wasn't repaired, that wasn't harmed, that wasn't damaged. One of the nice, greatest things about using an enzyme is that because they facilitate that, that precipitation of calcite, of calcium carbonate, and then they go on and do the next one, that um, these enzymes can go through millions of rounds of production um, and just continue working. So as long as the environment in which the enzyme is, is not harming it, then the enzyme will continue to create the repair products as it has enough material to create the repair products with. Um, and so we found that we could create large volumes of our calcium carbonate repair product, and we found that we had good bonding to our substrate. We had a really, we had a decent repair, um, and it was naturally driven, which was important to me and important to our, our lab. Once added to this uh, cementitious um, material, um, what happens to the durability and consistency of the mixture? Mm. So in our research, we sort of did, we did two ways of adding in the enzyme into, and to sort of see how we could repair it in two ways. So let's say we had a, a damaged concrete sample. So a sample that I had made that I had created a flaw in. Um, first thing that I did was to try to repair that sample using a solution. And the solution had the enzyme and it had um, some, or they used calcium chloride in it as well. And it had a buffer to stabilize the solution. And then within that solution, there was bubbled carbon dioxide gas um, to simulate the carbon dioxide that we have in our environment. <clears throat> and we took that solution and, um, sort of soaked it through the concrete to repair our man-made flaws. And um, that was one way that we chose to, to sort of approach the idea of creating a repair material for already cracked concrete. And that worked fairly well. And that was where we were able to find that we had good strength in our repairs. Now, the other way that we looked at incorporating the enzyme into the concrete was by actually mixing it into the concrete. And so a concrete mix when it's in its wet state, so this is before it cures, when it's in its like wet slurry soupy type of thing is a mixture of our ordinary Portland cement powder, OPC, which is really fine and gray and quite dusty. It looks like dirt, dusty dirt, um, and water, and coarse and fine aggregates, so your stones and your sand. Other things go into concrete mixes as well to, to affect um, placing conditions and to affect curing conditions such as time and to account for changes in temperature and weather and that kind of stuff. But the basic things that go into a concrete mix are your powder, Portland cement powder, water, and your coarse and fine aggregates. And now <clears throat> to that, we added the enzyme. So now we had five things in our mix. And the Carbonic anhydrase enzyme, I added in with the water phase. So if I consider that we have initially four phases in the in a mix, the powder, the water, the coarse and fine aggregates, I added the enzyme to the water. So now, and I mixed it quite thoroughly. And the enzyme survives at room temperature quite well. Um, and there's a long history of 
chromatic anhydrase enzyme being used for like so many things that it's mutatable and genetically able to be designed to survive the environments that you want, which is also another reason why we chose it. And I can get into that in a minute. Um, and so then we mix the enzyme in with the water and then allowed the concrete to cure. Now, what this did was it created now a cured concrete substrate, so a solid rock that had this enzyme in it. And what we created was a less permeable concrete mix. And this was important to us because if you go back to what I was saying at the beginning about <clears throat> how concrete deteriorates out in the world, the with the chlorides from roadway salts, right, making their way through that concrete cover to the rebar and then the rebar would rust and cause issues. If we can reduce the permeability of a structure of a concrete substrate by um, uh, by incorporating the enzyme into the mix and letting it cure in there, then we can prevent ingress or uh, prevent the entry of those roadway salts through to the level of the rebar. And if we can do that, then we can extend the life of concrete structures beyond what they would be able to have without the enzyme. And so that um, incorporating the enzyme into our structure, into our into our concrete mix, um, we found was able to give us a lower permeability, to which then we reasoned further that that would be a more durable and uh, more resilient concrete out in the world. For example, for a concrete roadway or a retaining wall where you have lots of de-icing salts there to begin with in cold climates. Right. And so uh, now in your research paper, your team explains how the material that you created took inspiration from the biological process of carbon dioxide transfer in cells. So could you explain a little more about this inspiration and how you applied it to concrete? Sure. Um, so, <clears throat> so enzymes are proteins in the very simplest sense. I'm also not a biologist, so <laughs> um, forgive me, my biology colleagues. <laughs> And biochemistry colleagues. Enzymes are proteins. In the simplest sense, they catalyze, or in other words, speed up the rate of a biological reaction. Now, what's important, what I mentioned before, is that they're not bound to the end products of the reaction. So that means, like what I was saying, that the enzyme will facilitate the formation of a product and then release itself and go off and facilitate the formation of another product and so on and so forth. Um, but they maintain the same properties, whether they have catalyzed or sped up one reaction or thousands or millions of reactions. So chromatic anhydrase enzyme, it's a set of metalloenzymes containing five classes. And they are um, alpha, beta, gamma, delta, and zeta, I think. And within the human body and in other animal species, they help to maintain the pH and carbon dioxide, CO2 levels in the cells in the body. And Carbonic anhydrase enzyme is also found in all living species. In human tissues, there's 16 variants. Um, and so it's completely widespread. The variant I used was a bovine variant in the lab, so something from cows. Um, and now one nice thing about chromatic anhydrase is that because it's so prolific throughout the world and because it's necessary for maintaining pH and carbon dioxide levels in cells in humans, um, it's vital for life. It's one of the fastest known enzymes with a really high rate of catalysis. And so that really high rate of being able to catalyze or speed up a chemical reaction is really important when we're thinking about choosing an enzyme for um, research like this and for an enzyme that we would want to be able to work with in the future. We want something that is really robust, that's found everywhere, that we can that works really fast. Those are good things to have. <clears throat> so um, the carbonic anhydrase, it catalyzes the reversible hydration of carbon dioxide and water to bicarbonate and protons. And so what that means is that we have carbon dioxide and it can be 
um, absorbed into water. Um, and the carbonic anhydrase enzyme will take the C, the carbon from carbon dioxide, and it will separate it from its O and it'll um, break apart the water into bicarbonate, which is um, HCO3, and also protons, which are H plus hydrogen ion, um, cations. And then if you also have the presence of calcium ions, which is very important for concrete research, um, then you'll form calcium carbonate and it will precipitate out of our solution. And so the reason why this is really important for concrete research is because concrete itself is calcium based. We take a minor step back because a lot of this research is very linked all over the place, come to think of it. Um, ordinary Appointment Cement Powder, the binding agent that you hydrate to make concrete, to turn it from a, a dry powder to a wet mix to a hard stone once it cures, um, that Ordinary Appointment Cement Powder is created by crushing limestone and kilning it, and so burning it off in a rotary kiln to turn it from a white stone into a dark gray powder then that dark gray powder has lost all its hydration products during the kiln process. And so it's ready to be rehydrated and to bind things together. The calcium <clears throat> is the kind of like necessary and building block component, like that foundational component that's in concrete chemistry. And so it's really interesting to me to understand further how incorporating our CA, our carbonic anhydrase enzyme, into a calcium-based material, how that will perform in the long term. And that's not something we've studied um, yet, but it's something that's sort of like in the plan of studying. Um, and I think I got a little bit off topic here, but I was talking about um, kind of the carbonic anhydrase process and, and why, it, why calcium is important to it, <clears throat> specifically for concrete. So um, let's see. The enzyme then, um, in this research, we have the calcium carbonate product or the calcite product, and um, we use that as our repair material in our broken concrete structures. Now, something I had to mention before, but it's worth talking about really, really briefly, is that the carbonic anhydrase enzyme can be genetically engineered and modified to perform in extremely intense and harsh conditions. And that's really, really important because the pH of wet concrete is up around 12 to 13, which is very far away from our neutral pH of 6 to 7. And so um, when you have really high pH like that, it will kill most things. Um, but our enzyme, our chromatic anhydrase enzyme, tended to survive those conditions of wet concrete through to curing. And that was something that was really important to us also, that we had an enzyme that would survive that curing period of concrete. Um, once concrete cures, it, its pH will drop over time to around 9.5. Um, now, other versions of chromatic anhydrase enzyme have been used to, um, for example, scrub smokestacks. So in an industrial process or commercial process, if you have a lot of really dirty smoke coming out of um, maybe a combustion process, or if you're burning things for um, turning it into trash, or if you've got any sort of heat generation that produces a smoke, um, you can use carbonic anhydrase to scrub and to pull those solid particles out of your smoke stream. And you can Carbon and anhydrase has been found to survive at temperatures above 100 degrees C in smokestacks and in pressures as high as 1,000 atmospheres. And that's huge because that means this enzyme, in its specific genetically modified forms, can tolerate extreme environmental conditions just through small changes in its proteins or its amino acid sequence. And that's really important to, to understanding how this enzyme or this family of enzymes is initially well suited to the world of working with concrete. Is your material to be added to existing concrete structures in order to eliminate the need for renovations, or is it a completely new product? Uh, 
a little from column A and a little from column B, I would say, for that answer. And that kind of goes back to the two ways that I described and how we looked at incorporating this enzyme, the CA enzyme, into repairing concrete structures. The first one, which was um, in an aqueous solution or in a liquid solution um, that we applied to already cracked or damaged concrete to seal those cracks and to smooth and to seal the surface pores to um, repair and bring a structure back up to its initial strength. And then the other way, if we embed the enzyme in a new concrete product, so if we're talking about we've got a new retaining wall, we've got a new concrete roadway going down, and we're going to add the enzyme into the wet mix before the concrete gets placed, um, that would be a way that we would place the enzyme, um, mix it in with that water phase, and then we would have a product in the end from our research that shows initial research that shows that we have a, a less permeable structure. And so those are the two where we're looking at, can we repair an existing crack structure? But is there another method? Can we place new concrete that has low permeability and therefore a longer durability and longevity of a structure? So both. And and they, we had different we had different benefits come out of the two different methods, and so that was also really interesting to see um, that we had really good high strength regains when repairing structures, but also low per low permeability, and both of those things are benefits. We also <laughs> the last last thing I'm thinking about this is that we also found that uh, concrete with the enzyme in it. So when we did method two or option two, where we mixed it in with the, before we placed the concrete, we found that we had um, an increase in the tensile strength of the concrete itself, which was really fascinating and merits much further study in my view. So conventional concrete lasts about 50 years or so on average before needing uh, really serious repairs, uh, I think. So have you tested your material to determine if it can uh, last longer than that concrete? In short, no. So I started my graduate work in 2014 at, at Worcester Polytechnic Institute at WPI. And at that time, I hadn't started to kind of delve into the world of concrete. I was working on another project. And then um, I think it was in 2015 or 2016 that I started to work on this project. And so we haven't had our 50-year our <laughs> time span um, to get to that point. And so no, we haven't tested it in a very long time span. Um, so our testing has been on the short time scale age of things. And this is really important to note. And that when you think about, um, this goes back to one of the ways that I mentioned that concrete can deteriorate. Um, the alkali aggregate reaction where you have an issue with the stone in the concrete and then over time it'll form that expansive foam. When this reaction was discovered, when people started to see the foundations in their homes crumble and fall apart, it took petrographic analysis. It took a um, sort of like a CSI type of analysis into concrete um, to understand why it was failing from the inside out and to understand that certain types of rocks should not be used for um, for aggregates and concretes and that took time to understand that that reaction was occurring and then to study it and then to make sure that we didn't put those aggregates in concrete anymore so nowadays aggregates are tested to make sure that they won't have that reaction so that we don't have that happen again um, and so I'm not saying that that will happen with this research, but I think that this research needs to be on, conducted on a much longer time scale to truly understand the long-term effects of both beneficial and potentially detrimental, because you know the world is open to possibilities um, that we could have by repairing surfaces with a carbonic anhydrous enzyme solution and by also um, placing new concrete with our Carbonic anhydrous, carbonic anhydrous enzyme in it. And um, from my point of view, as a professional engineer, as a civil engineer, um, 
I like to uphold the safety and the health and welfare of the people and that use all of the structures out there in the real world. And so <clears throat> it's one of the canons of the American Society of Civil Engineers. Plug them right there. Um, you have to uphold the safety, health, and welfare of the traveling public, the people who use your structures. And that means making sure that the materials you use are safe in the long term. And to me, that means that this research needs to be tested in the long term because it's in its infancy. It's only a few years old, to be quite honest. Um, and so it needs that long term testing. And it's something that needs further investment. But it's also a good thing to think about because I'm a fan of encouraging higher education so that students can pursue deeper knowledge. They can have a greater understanding of the things that affect the world around them. And if we have an area identified of concrete research, now we can try to kind of make that a focus for several PhDs, for you know dozens of graduate students over time to really understand how this potential new material with an enzyme in it might be able to give us longer, stronger, more durable concrete structures. I want to amend your, your sort of lifetime span of concrete that's conventional. Um, nowadays, that has been extended from 50 years to 100 years. And so when we design the, a concrete structure, we control our mix design and we control our placement conditions as best we can. And we control our in-service conditions to make sure that our concrete will not crack excessively and that it will not undergo loads that we can't anticipate and that it won't deteriorate too much over those 100 years that it'll be considered um, in need of serious repair or structurally deficient would be the catchphrase for that. You might have heard that about bridges around the United States recently or since <clears throat> 2012, let's say. Um, so one way that you can think about the lifespan of a concrete structure or of any structure is that um, kind of the intersection of two curves. So you have the strength of a structure and the durability and its longevity is going to be 100% when it's freshly placed. And then over time, you're going to get a decrease in that um, strength and that durability. And we call that sort of overall the resiliency of our structure. It starts out really great, and then over time, it, it degrades a little bit. What we want to make sure to happen is that over our 100-year lifespan, that we do not want to have our resiliency of our structure be overcome by the effects on it, so by our loads, by the effects of our weathering and environments and deterioration. And so when you think about the concept of serviceability, that 50, now 100-year lifespan of a structure, we want to make sure that we have good resiliency over that whole thing. Um, so 75 years is accepted right now by many agencies, and they're advocating for 100 years, I guess I should say for kind of changes to, to the governing codes and standards and specifications. So traditional concrete is detrimental to the environment, um, not because it's like a particularly harmful material or that it has um, a large carbon fo footprint per capita, but just because of the sheer amount of it that we use, right? Um, so how does your um, uh, cementitious material solve this issue or address this issue? Yeah, there's, there's no one solution. And I definitely want to stress that. Um, you're correct in saying that the, like the overall life cycle analysis of concrete shows that it's not as harmful to our environment as say, for example, steel or um, production of other materials. But it is still something that is creating lots of carbon dioxide out in the world. Um, estimates for the total um, amount of greenhouse gases that get produced into the atmosphere on an annual basis, um, estimates for concrete production and placement, 
range from like five to nine percent, depending on the year in which the study was conducted within the last 10 years and the agency that's done the conduction, but that's sort of like a range. Um, and so it's not a large amount of greenhouse gases of the total that's contributed by concrete, but it is an amount that we is quantifiable through a life cycle analysis. Um, so as you say, there's, um, it's, it's not going to solve the issue, um, but this research does seem to have a potential to create a little bit of an impact and to sort of like dig away into the amount of greenhouse gases that gets produced um, by concrete on an annual basis. So we're able to estimate the amount of carbon dioxide consumption from our chemical reactions within our material. So <clears throat> we can say that the rate of our CO2, our carbon dioxide, our greenhouse gas, right, is consumed for um, by our specific reactions with our enzyme to create our calcium carbonate. And we estimate this directly from the change in the pH of our solution. So when we're in the lab, we have our, um, I got beakers and I've got a pH meter in there and I can track the pH over time. And um, we have two hydrogen ions are produced for every molecule of carbon dioxide consumed. And this ends up giving us in our lab data um, about almost one mole of carbon dioxide per minute consumed. So um, if we have, yeah, that's about our consumption of carbon dioxide per minute when we were using our aqueous solution method to apply a repair to an existing concrete structure. Um, so for every liter of our solution, it was a little over 10 grams of carbon dioxide was consumed per liter. Um, so that like active reduction in carbon dioxide to create a repair material for existing structures is something that to me is attractive as a long-term research topic because we have to be able to reduce the amount of greenhouse gases that go into our atmosphere. I've, we just had the ICC report come out um, a couple days ago, a week ago, so we have basically, we're in the state of runaway climate change, right? So we have to be able to reduce CO2 emissions and greenhouse gas emissions. It's not a large amount, right? It's not a large amount of CO2. You think like, oh, 10 grams of carbon dioxide per liter of solution. It's not huge, but it's something. Right. And so talking more big picture now about your project. So do you think that the self-repairing uh, material that you created will soon be available for general use? Or do you think it's too early in development for mass production? For example, taking into consideration variables like uh, cost efficient cost efficiency and things like that. So I think that the field of self healing concrete and my self activated healing concrete, however it gets phrased in the media, I think that this field is at an inflection point with regard to commercialization. And this is really important. We're getting a lot of media buzz right now. Um, the so-called economic low hanging fruit of concrete, the thing that is easy to be repaired and, and sort of fixed by this research is durability. And I think that the, the enzymatic concrete, the cementition control we've studied and researched in the lab has the potential to solve this problem of durability. Um, so it's, I, going back to what you mentioned earlier about like the concept of has this material been tested in the long term? It hasn't yet. And so I think that it's, it's ready to undergo that testing to make sure that it's safe for use out in the world so that we um, will have a material that is durable and less permeable and a little bit higher tensile strength in the long term and that it will stay that way. And so I think that that we're really at an inflection point where we have self-healing cementitious materials have a lot of buzz and this one in particular can consume carbon dioxide. And so those are two really good things. And it's, I think it's ready for the next step of the studies to really focus on um, long-term structural safety and efficiency. Um, but it's also, I think, ready for small-scale commercial tests to make sure that, to sort of like combine those two things to say, we're ready to start testing out in the world for something that is extremely low risk 
and that'll sort of start our long-term testing phase. Um, and then we can also start long-term testing in the laboratory kind of a thing. <clears throat> um, yeah, so it's it's not it's not ready for mass production in the that I would not I'm not confident in the level of testing we have right now to make sure it's safe to go out to be a bridge or a foundation for a home or foundation for a tall building. I just don't think that we're there in testing, but I think that we're ready to do lower risk scenarios as well as um, longer term studies. And in terms of the question of it being kind of like the um, economics of it, adding the enzyme into fresh concrete or into new concrete um, adds about uh, five to ten dollars per cubic meter. So if you have um, a concrete, what is it like ninety dollars cubic meter or something like that? Um, I'm trying to remember, it's been a while since I looked at the cost, but it only adds like a really small amount to the overall cost of a cubic meter of concrete. Um, and now, and to me, if you can increase your tensile strength and increase your strength and repair cracks and reduce permeability and it have a longer life structure, then those additional incremental costs would be worth it in my eyes. Finally, what sorts of um, improvements are you looking to make um, to your material in the future? Mm. So there's a few things other than what I've already mentioned that do need to be studied. Um, we found that we have a higher early age compressive strength when we mix our enzyme into our concrete. And by that I mean that um, concrete takes on average 28 days to cure and to cure fully, to go from a wet soupy paste to something that when we say we've achieved full strength or design strength. When we've mixed our enzyme into our product, we have higher early age strength. So after one day, we have higher strength than if we don't mix in the enzyme into, our, into a concrete mix. And high early strength, high early compressive strength is important for construction industries because it means that you can strip forms sooner. Uh, forms are the physical sh um, shell that you see out there on construction sites that they pour concrete into. So forms can be made of plastic, they can be made of plywood, they can be made of steel, um, and the form or styrofoam sometimes. Um, and if you can strip forms, that's the phrase, sooner, then you can use those forms to place more concrete. And so your construction rate can speed up if you have higher early compressive strength. And so our, our early age increase in strength, what we found in the research, um, to me that bears more study to understand truly why that was happening on a chemical level. Um, and be, it was a promising result, but we want, I want to make sure that we don't have a trade-off of high early age strength and a reduction in some other property of the concrete later on down the road. And so um, I think longer age time studies with more um, of a chemistry focus within this research will be really, really well received in the community, in the scientific community, but also um, for the longevity of this material down the road. Um, and so that means that we can study things like workability while it's wet, um, which sort of describe how um, you can fine tune the mix design. So those ratios of enzyme and Portland cement powder and water and aggregates and other additives to obtain the best possible mix. Um, and we want to make sure that we're not overdosing or underdosing a mix with the amount of enzyme that we put in. And so those kinds of things I think are worth studying. And that's sort of like where I see this research going in the future. Um, and there's, there's already grad students who, who sort of are working on it now. I finished my PhD and I'm teaching. Um, there's a grad student, his name's Shui, he's wonderful. He's um, 
he's doing kind of continuing the lab studies um, about this material itself. And so it's, yeah, it, it's, it's already like starting to see the evolution of like being able to train more students and, and get better knowledge about concrete in the long term. Thank you so much, Dr. Rosewitz. Um, those are basically all of the questions that we had. It was an honor having you on the podcast. Um, it was really fun and we learned a lot. Okay. I'm glad to, um, I'm happy to have been able to do this. Thank you. And good luck with the future of your self, um, self-repairing, self-activating cementitious material. And I hope that uh, your future research goes well and is successful as well. Thank you, Vishnu. Thank you, Shinshim.